Hello, everybody. I'm Seth Perez, an intern here at uh, OC Habitats, and I wanted to introduce you guys to the Western Snowy Plover. It's a very cute little threatened shorebird here on the uh, West Coast, and specifically, uh, we're talking about Southern California area. And uh, when you get to learn, the more you learn about it, the more you fall in love with it. So please join me for this uh, presentation. So as I mentioned, this is the uh, Western Snowy Plover. Um, it's six inches tall, so from this photo, you can tell it's, it's not a very big, well, it's hard to tell. Uh, it's not a very big bird, but um, I do have to share a little Latin with you guys because it's a species uh, discussion. So if you can say it with me, Charadrius nevosus nevosus. That's very, very Harry Potter. But um, so let's get into the species identification. The bird, uh, as you can see in the photo, um, this little angry bird, uh, let's look at number one here. The backside is a pale sand color. Um, it's great for camouflage. Um, the, the times that I've been fortunate enough to see the bird in person, they they will turn your back. If you're so I'm the predator and they'll see me, they'll turn their back towards me. And all I can see is the little eyes kind of looking back at you. So it's a great way to hide and great way to um just not be seen by the predators in the area. If we look at number two here, um this identifies a male. So as you can see, the black spots on the uh, the neck, below the eye, and on the crown, um, that signifies that it's mature. And that's just one of the main ways to identify, okay, you know, this is a Western snowy plover. And then lastly, the, uh, the beak, it's a black, short beak. And um, it separates it out from many of the other bird species, which you'll, you'll see right now. So this first one, the semi-palmated plover, similar, uh, similar in size, but the colors are very different. And um, I wanted to let you guys see how different they are, because when people go spotting plovers, they a lot of times they get the wrong ones. So with the semi-pollinated, um, you can see the beak is orange and black, um, and the legs are also orange in color, um, but it has very similar habits in terms of uh, eating. But let's go to the next the next bird that's been uh, mistaken a lot, which is the Western Sandpiper. And this bird um, clearly has a longer beak that is black. At the same time, the, the legs are also um, dark in color. And the, diff the main difference is when you see them feeding, they'll, be ten they'll tend to dig for the food and be on the water where plovers will not be. Um, and then the last one, most common that gets mistaken is the Sanderling. Um, Distinctly, the colors are just very different. It's black and white. And um, they do hunt in packs like the plovers, but they tend to chase the shore, um, out of the water as the sh as it comes up to the shore. And they'll, they'll, they're, they're trying to catch bugs that are caught in the waves that are as the water recedes. And then a uh, fun little note, um, a, survey, a survey by Cornell Lab in 2023 identified the oldest known uh, Western snowy plover to be 15 years and nine months old uh, found in Oregon. So they can they can get up there. They can they can live a, a pretty long time. Let's talk about their habitats. So the main thing is uh, they're non-migratory birds. Um, so they're here in Southern California year round. As you can see, the the range goes all the way up from Oregon and Pacific Northwest down to Baja. Um, they like to uh, the areas I think we we've, we've seen them the most in specifically is Bolsa Chica uh, and the Bolsa Chica State Beach. That's where I've seen them. Um, I was I've been to Bolsa Chica many times, and it wasn't until I got with the organization to finally um, spot them that I was able to see them. And yeah, they're they're very they're very wonderful to see, and they're such a small, fragile looking bird that you you know it's hard not to care for them once you see them. But um, when they're in their breeding period, they tend to move into the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve, which is just north of the state beach. And that just it has safety um, fences and it's way more protected. But in general, for our Southern California region, that's Southern California regions, that's where we've been seeing them. In terms of uh, where they are on the beach, as you can see here on the right side, um, the dunes are where they're usually at. And they tended to make nests at the fore dune, which is the center of the dune. They're not at the peak or the top of the dune. Um, they try to they try to stay below that, and from the foredoom they can go um, feed off the rack line, 
and um, the rack line is near the water. But when high tide comes in, it brings in organic material. And that's where a lot of our birds will will try to feed and spend most of the time at. So those are the area, the key areas you're trying to look for when you're trying to spot the the, the plover in general. And um, as you can see, uh, Orange County area, Seal Beach to San Clemente, we'll, gen we'll generally find them. Um, the breeding areas include what I mentioned, Bolsa Chica Eco Ecological Reserve and the State Beach. Also to uh, San Onofre Beach and Trestles, and then by Camp Pendleton. And then further, uh, the critical habitat means uh, it's habitat that's very important for the plovers to survive. And it's protected for them because they are a threatened species, which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. But uh, those critical habitats are Newport Beach uh, near the Santa Ana River and by the Pal Balboa Peninsula near the, between the Balboa Pier and the Wedge. Keep moving on. Their diet, um, as you can see in the photo on the left, uh, they they hunt they hunt in packs on the rack line. So you'll see them out there in little groups. Um, the the videos that I've seen of them, they they run full charge into a, a swarm of flies, and they have their mouths open, almost like a whale trying to catch a bunch of fish. It's it's pretty awesome to see. Um, but as I as I mentioned, there are uh, they do feed off of the flies, the fly larvae, um, snails, and tiny crustaceans. Even the Pacific mole crab, if you've been digging for crabs at uh, Bolsa Chica, you'll tend to find a lot of them in that area. And then in terms of nesting, um, the breeding seasons are March to September. Uh, they have two broods a year with three eggs and about a month for incubation. And then as you can see from the photo, their eggs are pale sand color with um, little spots of black, which make it easier for them to camouflage and hide from predators. Um, the biggest thing about their nests is that they tend to build them in, um, in almost anything that they can. They're very opportunistic like that. But most of the time they build it in what they call scrapes or shallow depressions in the ground that don't require any nesting materials. So from what I heard, some of the stories locally here, that uh, lifeguards and safety vehicles, when they drive along the sand, they they learn not to drive back on the same um, tire tracks because the birds will build nests on those tire tracks. So they'll build it on anything they can, even, even footprints. Um, so yeah, a lot of their nests are built on kelp, driftwood, shells, rocks, human footprints, and, and tire tracks. And then I thought a cool little fact was that the males uh, take care and inhabit the nest at night while the, the females watch it during the day. So they're, they're rotating um, back and forth. And then most importantly, they, they're here breeding in the same location. So yeah, you, you, it's the same families that are coming in locally that we get to experience on our shores here. And then lastly, so only 50% of the birds will actually hatch and that's due to uh, predation or destruction. Like I kind of mentioned the tires or people stepping on them and then nest abandonment, which, um, which is actually quite common. So it's unfortunate that they only have 50% chance to actually hatch. <clears throat> and then let's get into the chicks. So the chicks are pre-cultural, which means uh, they move about on their own as soon as they're born. And uh, they begin to feed themselves within three hours. Um, they're very small, the size of a cotton ball uh, on toothpicks. So uh, if the plover is six inches in height, I'd, I'd guess that bird, the baby is maybe two inches. And unfortunately, um, their only defense is their camouflage. They can't really, they can't fly. They have no real way to cover themselves on the beach. And um, they're usually taken as well. But um, as you can see from the photo, that's the uh, the father and that's the baby following the father, um, probably hunting for food together. But uh, we do have a little, well, I'm sorry. And then the father stays with the chicks for about, an, about a month until they fledge. Um, fledge means when they fly and take off on their own and start to um, go on their own. And the fathers will also exhibit broken wing behavior, meaning if a predator is coming by near the, the chicks or the nest, the the uh, male will just display a broken wing like he's injured to attract the predator and get the predator away from the nest itself. And we do have a little video of the birds feeding.
So it's pretty amazing that these birds can start feeding within three hours. So that's that's pretty cool. And then moving on to uh, habitat impacts. So real quick, what do you guys think are the biggest threats to snowy plovers? Um, three, two, one. If you said humans, you're correct. You're very much correct. Humans are to blame for everything. And especially for this, because, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the habitats are, are having issues. But um, so as you can see here, coastal development approaching closer to shore is one of the biggest issues. Um, people are buying houses closer to shore. It's just it's better investment for them. And unfortunately, it's destroying a lot of their their habitat and breeding environment. Um, next that humans do uh, are, are trash, as you see in the photo. Uh, a lot of people just, they don't pick up the trash, they leave it, and uh, species come in that want to eat that trash. And that includes uh, crows, gulls, and ravens. And after those species come in for the trash, they see these vulnerable plover populations, and they start to, um, you know, feed off them, unfortunately. Um, domestic animals are also a major problem. Um, it's not the animals themselves, it's just people not following the leash laws. Um, on many of the beaches and letting their animals roam. And a lot of times the animals, when they roam, they can disturb the nests. They can cause the birds to flee. And um, the birds will abandon their nests if they feel like the predator um, is in the area like frequently. So that's that's one thing that we need to uh, take care of, make sure the dogs are leashed where they're supposed to be at. Um, and then lastly, recreation. So we're, we are seeing a lot more recreation, especially here in Southern California, more kites. Kites look like a predator vehicles on the beach, drones, unfortunately, and then um, bikes. We are seeing a higher number of bikes with the uh, rental service on your app to rent a bike. So that's a higher number that we've seen in our survey data, unfortunately. So all of these kind of scare away or harm our birds, unfortunately. And then next, we'll go to the natural predators. So all these predators have very similar um, um, stats to them. They're they're very um, how do you say they're in, you know they're opportunistic. Um, the crows and ravens are very intelligent, so they will follow the trash. But at the same time, they understand where the plover species will be, and that they are um, kind of easy to to get taken. So unfortunately, um, crows and ravens are a big big issue with that. Um, Gulls, this is the same thing. They're very opportunistic. They'll try to feed off, you know, anything that they can. And I, again, they go for the eggs in the nest. The same with coyotes. And then uh, raccoons as well. I mean, they, uh, they we've had spotted tracks on the beach and in the areas of them where they, the plovers actually uh, habitate. So unfortunately, they, you know, a lot of predators out there trying to get them. But uh, continuing on the list, there's also squirrels, raptors, falcons, and then uh, peregrine falcon and the kestrel. And now we'll move on to other impacts. The American beach grass, it's a non-native plant, meaning it's not from here. Uh, it was introduced to Southern California in 1930s to stabilize the dunes, uh, mostly found in San Luis Obispo. But um, it's, it's so invasive that it reduces the biodiversity of the area. So invasive means that it kind of takes over. It doesn't let lights or water or just the land itself get used by other plants, it, it takes over the region and it creates a habitat that is not as not as effective or efficient for the local animals to live. Um, let's move on to the ice plant, which we see a lot here in Southern California. Um, that's probably the one we see the most. You'll see it along the freeways and off ramps and on ramps. But uh, again, this is non-native. It's actually from South Africa brought here in the 1900s to stabilize the railroads. And um, it is invasive, very similar to how I mentioned, it kind of takes over the area, it takes over all the other plants. And then lastly, in terms of plants, the beach sand verbena, um, it's a low growing perennial and has sticky hairs on its roots and stems. So a lot of times the, uh, the birds can actually get caught, the chicks can get caught on those stems, which is unfortunate and uh, we, they, have passed away trying to get over those those stems itself and it is a native but unfortunately just because you know it's invasive it makes it harder for the birds to live um some other issues are as we know sea level rise is here um it's it's slowly coming in in southern california 
and throughout the world. So it's it's limiting their 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 zone for their living, and it makes it more difficult. Um, Tropical Storm K that we had recently um, in San Clemente uh, created swells and storm surge that damaged the rail line, and um, it was estimated by the California Transportation Commission that the repair for that rail line would be cost twelve million dollars. So a lot of these, uh, you know, global climate changes are making it more difficult for these birds to live and costing us a lot of money to fix, which, you know, it's difficult for everybody. Let's move on to uh, status protection and restoration. So the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, uh, lists snowy plovers as near threatened. Um, the IUCN is a recognized global authority on the status of species and measures to, uh, the ways to safeguard them. Um, threatened means likely to become endangered. So unfortunately, they have a higher chance of you know not surviving. Um, along with that, the Federal Endangered Species Act also listens a, also listed them as threatened in 1993. And furthermore, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife lists them as special concern, which is very similar to threatened, but meaning that we need to enact legislation to to safeguard and keep them to keep them uh, alive. And, and healthy. And there are fewer than 1,500 breeding populations found throughout California. So there's, there's not that many left um, in terms of pairs that are breeding out there. So it's, we, we do have to take care of these birds and do our best to help them. And that's where we get into the role of uh, OC habitats. And, uh, and that's where I come in a little bit. So we have uh, habitat education programs. Um, we'll educate schools along with Girl Scout programs. We'll do guided hikes. We'll do outreach programs. Um, and we try to do educational info on our website, including this video. And we do posts on social media in terms of like, you know, education um, days or events that we're having. So you guys can definitely check that out. We also do um, habitat monitoring, um, which I do specifically. We'll monitor the birds and count how many are there, and including the predators and what issues are going on there. But um, we'll do that at the coastal dunes. Tucker Wildlife Sanctuary. We also do sea urchin monitoring. That's one of my favorite projects to do. Uh, we also do the Eyes on Nest Site program, the EONS at Bolsa Chica. And that's the way we get some of our survey data for a lot of the birds. And then lastly, we do restoration events, which is also fun. And the public can, can really get into that um, too. We'll do rest restoration events at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy, uh, Newport Back Bay with Project Row. And we'll also do restoration events at uh, the Turtle, Knock, Turtle Rock Nature Center. So yeah, we have a wide variety of things we do, and, and the public can feel free to join in a lot of them, which you know, which is cool. Which is how I got started. Um, our partners include the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve, which you know I kind of mentioned a little bit, and we work uh, in close contact with uh, Ross Griswold. Gris Ross Griswold, um, he's the one that could establish the enclosures to protect the birds. Uh, known as MEs, and uh, as you can see from the photos, I, I guarantee you the bird's happy, even though you know, it, it does look kind of dreary with the, the fence around it. It's actually protecting the bird from predators from landing and, and taking the nest. So um, yeah, it's it's one of the ways that we'll try to help you know save the save the bird nests and try to pro let them propagate a little bit better. And then we also do banding. Well, you say Ross will do the banding, so he will. Uh, ban the birds mostly when they're chicks and that will help understand their numbers and how well they're doing and, and species survival in general. Um, here's some of our partner organizations that I mentioned. Um, again, we work with Newport Back Bay, Bolsa Chica, the Tucker Wildlife Sanctuary, City of Santa Ana, um, Project Grow, Irvine Ranch Conservancy, and then the Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. And then a little bit of call to action for everybody. Um, if if you can't, you know, if you have a hard time joining our organization or other volunteer organizations, just whenever you go out on the beach, do your best pick up the trash. That'll help keep away invasive predators. Um, and then with dogs too, just try to be a little more vigilant. I mean, I have a dog. I think everyone else the Habitat has a dog. We we you know we love our pets, but just try to follow the the rules. Try to keep them on the leash when when you can and keep them in their designated areas so it's a little personal action you know that each one of us can do whenever we go to the beach which will help the plovers tremendously um if you, you guys feel free to educate others um i'm you know i'm trying to educate others in this video 
um, do some volunteering if you guys feel up for it. We have plenty of dates for volunteering. We're restorations or, you know, some of the different cleanups that we do all over Bolsa Chica. So yeah, feel free to uh, to join us or any other organization. Um, donate. Uh, you know, donation is the lifeblood of many, many organizations, especially ours. So yeah, feel free to uh, to donate if you guys if you guys want to, um, and then vote, uh, vote for actions that protect you know local beaches or you know the, the different plant habitats and bird habitats. It's just a great way to uh, help protect the animals, and um, just a little a little fact here: plovers have been here on the Pacific coast for thousands of years. So if we can, you know, let's try to share the shore together. And lastly, you know, just want to thank everyone here um, for the, you know, join the presentation. Uh, I invite you guys to go to our website. We have much more info on there, uh, more educational content for videos like these, more ways to volunteer. And then again, if you guys feel like donating, feel free. At, you know, any any bit you can really helps us. You know, we can get out there and protect the species some more. And uh, yeah, appreciate you guys. I'll see you guys in the next video or the next event we have. So yeah, thank you very much. Take care.